This is Spectrum. Alternative Myths. Homeopathy. Secret Society. Hypnosis. The Paranormal. Alternative Energy. UFO. Abduction. The Weird. The Wild. And the Wonderful. With your hosts, Tom Theophanos and Scott Jordan. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Spectrum Radio Network on BBS Radio 2. I'm Scott Jordan. We hear my co-host, Tom Theophanist. And remember, there's no such thing as too much information. Okay, we got another week gone by, and we got a special guest today. Yes, who do we, we do. Who do we got? We have uh, Vincent Bridges, who was on our show back in January the 18th, 2011. Uh, Vincent is a historian, author, and a self-proclaimed anthropologist of the weird. He's the co-author of The Monuments to the End of Time, Alchemy, Falconelli, and the Great Cross, and The Mysteries of the Great Cross of Hende, Alchemy and the End of Time. His latest work is called The Orphanic Revelation, and is currently working on several books on Shakespeare, Rural Fine, Prague, and the Hermetic Revolution. Uh, today we're going to be discussing about the dwellings of the alchemists. So let's welcome Vince back to the show. Hey, Vince. Good evening. Welcome back, Vincent. Thank you for having me. Now, you're, since we, when we last talked to you, uh, you were at your home, and uh, you were planning a trip to go to Prague. And you were going to be staying in Sir Edward Kelly's tower, and you are now there. That's right. I, I'm living at the Donkey in the Cradle, also known as Kelly's Tower. And you're, you're uh, working on a book talking about uh, Edward Kelly, and, yeah. and you're also uh, doing some, esca- uh, you know, you're checking out some uh, tunnels that are <laughs> underneath, and you're, on, you're up in the attic, and you're, you're checking things out there. Maybe you could go through a little bit um, about that. Okay. Um, well, this is a, a, a really old house. It was rebuilt in 1545 after the Great Fire. But uh, part of the um, understructure of the crypts tend to go back to the 10th century or the 900s. I'll give you some idea how long something's been here. And um, it's a, a really odd, semi-famous house, uh, mainly because of its very strange house sign or name. Um, in old Prague, they didn't have house numbers. They had signs. And the signs all had some sort of strange esoteric meaning. So this one was uh, had a, a scene of a donkey uh, at the cradle in Bethlehem. Okay. And in Czech, it could be either the donkey at the cradle or the donkey in the cradle. The, uh, the, the word is the same for in and, and at. Mm-hmm. So um, for a long time, it was the donkey at the cradle. And then Edward Kelly, the famous alchemist, magician, etc., uh, bought it in 1589. And um, he apparently appreciated the joke of the donkey in the cradle and, and its connections to Apuleius's golden ass and Isis and so forth, because it seems to have been part of the attraction for buying the place. But after he died, the local legend about the name of the place here kind of shifted in strange ways. And uh, Kelly, of course, being a rather notorious figure, got written into the story. So the updated legend of the story of this house's name involves the local shrew busybody from the 1590s by the name of Anna Hradlova. And she apparently didn't like either the smells coming from the alchemical laboratories in the basement or something, and stopped by one day to chew Kelly out. And, of course, Kelly was not in the mood to be yelled at by the local uh, you know, busybody. So he said, Madam, run home and look at your child. And when she got back to her house, uh, her baby had been turned into a donkey. <laughs> And so this, of course, was, you know, quite an amazing thing. And the child was, of course, eventually turned back into a a real child through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, as the story goes. Now, the curious thing about this is not just how Kelly got involved in the local legend, 
but according to our supposition, and it's getting to be more than a supposition, that Shakespeare knew Kelly and was actually at this house. Mm. If you think about the story of Midsummer Night's Dream, in which one of the characters, Bottom, uh, is graced with an ass head or a donkey head, then you began to see that, okay, wow. there, there's some level of even deeper overlap going on. So I, I like to imagine Sir Edward sitting of an evening with his uh, skull cup mug full of pivo out in the courtyard and, and telling Irish fairy tale stories to a wild-eyed young 26-year-old Shakespeare who immediately writes it down and has a great hit back home in London. Yeah. But again, that's semi-imaginary but entirely possible. Sure. So the place at the moment is undergoing rather serious renovations. And part of what the renovations are for is that there's going to be uh, a very nice alchemical museum and um, Edward Kelly Museum in the place. Okay. So that's why I've had access to all these really bizarre places. Because the people who are getting ready to do the museum are really interested in, in finding those spots that the public would be most interested in seeing. So I'm uh, the resident uh, Kelly expert at the new Alchemical Museum here at the Donkey in the Cradle. Okay. And um, we've uh, been rummaging around down below the house in the crypts and up in the attic and up in the absolutely amazing observation tower. And there is a certain aura of weirdness that, that lingers over the whole place. It, it's like it has its own little atmosphere of, 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 you know, vibrational strangeness. Okay. Well, that's uh, the, the, um, the attic. Isn't that where Kelly was supposedly talking to the angels? Well. Or was that somewhere uh, else? Up in the attic, um, there is a number of things that have been painted and carved into the wall that would indicate that this is where Kelly had his magical space. And by that, I mean the place that he would have, again, talked to the angels if he was continuing those angelic sessions, or the place where he would have done the theurgy necessary to charge his prima materia for the alchemical transformations and so forth. And it's a really odd kind of spooky space. Um, it's a very big attic with, with these huge oak beams, 400-year-old oak beams, and a nice open space in the middle with a central chimney. And apparently there was a little stove in the chimney, and apparently around the space around the outside were bookcases or something of that nature. But there's a window that you can look out and see the top of the tower. Right. And this is an arrangement that was very common if you could find it. It was, how to put it, it was recommended as a good way to evoke spirits in several of the works of the time period, which would be to have a, an outside area in which the spirits could appear and that you could observe them from the safety of your little magic circle. Oh, okay. So apparently that uh, was the main use of the tower itself, was uh, for bringing whatever spiritual presences he was working with into full appearance so that he could look out the window and see them in the tower and communicate and so forth. Now, the tower itself is truly amazing. It has uh, an eight-sided cupola on top that's open, and each of the eight windows are pointing to the appropriate compass point. In other words, there's two east and west, two north and south, and then the other four on the, the quarter points. And um, it sort of makes it, in terms of feng shui, um, a very nice and juicy spot. Yeah. And you also have this incredible view down over Prague from up in the tower. And back in Kelly's day, there wasn't as many buildings in between uh, the tower and the castle. So you could also have seen from the tower up to uh, Prague Castle and the palaces along the side of Prague Castle, which plays a significant part in our love triangle between Shakespeare and Edward Kelly and the wife of the imperial chancellor, 
uh, Katerina de Montfort Haradish, who apparently is the dark lady of Shakespeare's sonnets. Wow. So again, the, the the sort of idea there is if the dark lady was on her way down to visit, she could put a uh, a candle in one of the windows at the uh, it's now the Haradshkini Palace, uh, then it was the Haradish Palace, and signal that she was on her way down through this secret passageways. Now the hill is full of weird little secret passageways, doors that open on uh, a set of steps that go in odd directions and so forth. But the real amazing thing is that from the basement here, there seems to be some evidence that there's a tunnel or a passageway going all the way up under Prague Castle and coming out somewhere in the castle itself. Right, and, and is this uh, – this is not open now. Oh, no, no, no. Um, it's been closed off apparently since the 1630s. We have found a um, set of blueprints from the 1630s showing that there are two rooms closed off and then a passageway going up the hill from them. And apparently no one's been in them since the early 1600s. So we really don't have any idea exactly what's in there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if the uh, national heritage, etc., um, doesn't really like the idea of openness, opening the passageway, well accidents do happen. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. I, oops, my sledgehammer slipped. Out. Oops, yes, I, I slipped. Oh, let's just shine a flashlight in there and see what's there. <laughs> there they, is there rooms or just a passageway? No, there are two large rooms. Okay. And off of that is a passageway. There's no indication how far the passageway goes on the blueprint. Uh, but it's going in the direction that would go up under the castle. So. Now, now, would those rooms be empty? I mean, like, once they sealed them, would they have emptied everything out beforehand? Ah, that's the big mystery. That's why it's going to be very entertaining to, to uh, see what's in there. There's a, a certain mystery about what happened to Edward Kelly's books and alchemical equipment and, um, you know, various manuscripts and so forth that we know he had at one point, but... They disappeared when he was thrown into the prison in Most in late 1595. So it's possible, since his wife Joanna actually retained control of the house um, on into the early 1600s, it's possible that Kelly's library, alchemical equipment, manuscripts, etc., are walled up in these two rooms uh, in the basement. Wow. Uh, is there any equipment that you could use to, to kind of scan uh, what could possibly be on the other side without breaking the, the place? Yeah, there is. Um, it's just a matter of, um, you know, who's going to actually pay for it. <clears throat> and at the moment, um, there's several plans afoot to do that. Um, it would certainly be a boost um, to the Alchemical Museum to be able to say, oh, look what we found, you know. I mean, you can you can always drill a little tiny hole, throw a camera through it, and go. Oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. Um, Didn't see that one <laughs> with the mouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's sort of under discussion. Um, but yeah, in, in the next three months or so, they're going to have the museum up and running, and um, we'll do something, hopefully on camera, uh, about opening those those rooms in the basement. Yeah, there could be all kinds. I mean, document. It could be a documentary, you know, like uh, the the Egyptian one opening the crypt, mm -hmm. yeah. opening the crypt that we already know is what's in there, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I'm hoping that uh, some of the same people that did some of my Nostradamus specials for the History Channel were will find this equally intriguing. So, oh, I'm sure they will. I mean, that's is... kind of in the works as well. But um, yeah, overall. Um, when you think about how many alchemists that there have been in Prague, and Prague is like the city of alchemy, like Paris is the city of art, you know? Right. In other words, it's the place where for hundreds of years, anybody who was into alchemy or magic, um, they ended up in Prague. And so it's sort of like out of all the alchemists and all the places that the alchemists lived in Prague, this is the only place that's more or less intact. Ah, okay. That's Some of the more famous alchemical uh, people, they've 
and their houses were burned or destroyed during the Thirty Years' War, or they'd been transformed into some new Baroque palace, and uh, uh, they're just no longer there. Right. Right? Like the Faust House is now a pharmacy for the hospital behind it. And, but this place, totally intact, it's gone through a few renovations, but it, it's all still here. You know, the, the attic, the family apartments, the basement, the tower, the courtyard, uh, the stables. You know, it's, it's all just, and, and, just and still here. And what, what else they could have, uh, you know, underneath? They might have had extra well, basements or something. Well, yeah, and um, there are indications that there may be more spaces that we haven't found that are not directly connected with the ones that we have found. Uh, because there are some odd things on on the blueprint under the tower itself. There may be a chamber actually under the base of the tower. But again, it's like okay, let's let's just keep exploring. Let's just see what comes up. Yeah, I mean, you never know. Yeah, it's, but it's truly fascinating um, how the local people here that live in this little area of Prague hang on to these legends and stories. That's right. It, it's almost like, you know, Edward Kelly and his family lived here last year, the way some of the people on on the little hill here talk about it. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, John D is, uh, he's pretty much the American, you know, when you talk to, uh, you know, people who research that area of alchemy, ancient yeah, alchemy. Yeah, he, he's, he's sort of the English-speaking world's uh, right. sort of perspective on this. Whereas but Edward it, again, Kelly, it's a whole, yeah, it's a whole different, uh, whole different trip in the Czech Republic. He's a, one of the local legends, you know, just a little bit below the whole golem story. And less well known, less well known than what I mean for obvious reasons. But um, I mean, he was the 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 master alchemist back then, wasn't he? Oh yeah, he's uh, not less well known in uh, this part of the world. Right. In other words, John D. is sort of like, oh, yeah, he was that scholar guy. But it, it's Magister Kelly, as they call him, oh. who gets all the legendary attention. And um, when you begin to study, um, and there's an enormous amount of reference material to him still available. Uh, in fact, you can go read uh, the transcript of when he was tortured on the rack mm. back in 1592. And that, that makes very entertaining reading material. Oh, yeah. And uh, so there's just an enormous amount of material in the archives in various places uh, about him. And he was literally one of the most famous people in Prague in the early 1590s. Um, right. There, there was a, a continuous stream of, of very strange and very important people that, that would show up at the house here. Well, he had the secret to making gold, right? I mean, he just wouldn't oh, yeah. tell anybody. Well, actually... He conducted uh, three transmutations in front of the Imperial Chamberlain, uh, Rudolf II's um, court alchemist, the official alchemist, and uh, the guy, the treasurer, the guy who assayed the gold and so forth. And he passed with flying colors all three of those transmutations. So that's pretty solid. Uh, you, you, you don't find that anywhere else in the history of alchemy, that there's anybody who's done three in front of witnesses uh, that could be verified. Yeah, um, I was wondering uh, any connection to the Rosicrucians uh, when, when they started later. Actually, there is quite a bit of connection. Um, we think of John Dee as being more directly influential on the Rosicrucians because his monad, hieroglyphic monad, appears in one of the key Rosicrucian texts. But in terms of practical influence, in terms of magical influence, um, Kelly is much more influential uh, than Dee. Kelly, um, particularly during his last few years, when he was having so much trouble with the king, um, talked to a large number of what we could only call students, people who would, in fact, later go on to do alchemical transmutations, and then people who were very influential in the philosophical side of what would become Rosicrucianism. So he's, again, sort of like the unappreciated, unnoted uh, grandfather of a lot of these traditions. And the reason why nobody really wanted to talk about him is that it was 
you know, not a good idea to be seen as being Kelly's good buddy uh, right on through uh, the whole rest of the period up till the Battle of White Mountain, um, simply because he had such a bizarre reputation. And since uh, the matter being thrown in prison and the little matter of the duel and so forth, uh, no one really wanted to admit that, oh, yeah, well, I, I got this from Kelly while he was in prison. Because that was a good way to get uh, Rudolph and then his brother Matthias uh, after you and, and to get your yourself thrown into prison. So yeah. um, so he's kind of in the background of a lot of this. Right. Okay. Uh, I remember you telling me a story um, when we talked uh, recently uh, about the clock in Prague. Uh -huh. I, said, I said that there was a lot going on with the Japan crisis right now and, uh, you know, stuff going on in the world. And you mentioned a story about the clock in Prague. Oh, yes. The, could, you, um, could you tell the listeners about that? Sure. The uh, clock at the Old Town Hall on uh, the Old Town Square in Prague is 600 years old. It just turned 600 last October. And it is a truly amazing piece of art and science. It's so amazing that we can't even begin to believe that they knew that much in 1410. But it shows several different times, kinds of time. It shows the difference between the summer hours and the winter hours. In other words, summer is longer, winter is shorter. It shows the phases of the moon. It shows the location of the sun. And it also marks sidereal time. The rotation of the earth against the sun is different from the rotation of the earth against a fixed star, just by a few minutes. But the clock has sidereal time marked as well. And it's an accurate polar projection showing uh, the Earth as a sphere. And uh, there weren't too many people in 1410 who really understood that. So it's fairly amazing. Yeah. Now, the story is, is that if anyone changes the face of the clock, they'll die. And the last person to do that back in the 19th century... Uh, readjusted the orientation of the calendar face below the clock face, shifted it 90 degrees, and yep, he died within a year of doing that. Oh my! So it's like, okay, don't don't do anything to the clock. Leave the clock now, alone. Leave, yeah. Yeah. Leave leave the clock alone. And again, that legend was sort of put in place to make sure that people who didn't understand it didn't screw with it. Right. Which is a good thing. And yeah. the other legend is that if the clock stops disaster happens and then if the clock is stopped for longer than a moon cycle for longer than a month uh, the town councilors start dying and that's one of these wonderful legends to make sure that the town council makes sure the clock runs you know quite nicely yes so at the moment we're at the end of a three-week period carefully chosen three-week period when the clock has been stopped um, for repairs and in the midst of that three-week period, we've had uh, earthquakes, tidal waves, tsunamis. They had uh, 37 people killed from uh, tornadoes back in North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here in Prague, the weather has been sunny. Everything has been just pleasant. Um, so it's like, okay, okay. But there is a really, um, how should we say, there's a little bit of anxiety that the clock is going to start back on Thursday like it's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they better hold. I mean, they're not going to push this past a month, are they? I mean, they're not that silly, are they? Well, no, that, that's, that's the, the joke is that, okay, which of the town council is ready to go if this thing doesn't start back up on Thursday? So. <laughs> wow. As, I mean, just curiosity. Has, I mean, this is local legend, so the local – Counselors must know about this local legend. Has anybody said, hey, guys, you know, might want to have this done by Thursday just in oh, case? Oh, yeah. I, I'm truly. The, the newspaper has even been talking about it. Okay. Because there's maybe a dozen town counselors who died in the last 600 years because the clock stopped for a significant amount of time. 
In other words, the, the people died during the time period that the clock was stopped, and everybody goes, oh, well, that's that's the curse. You know? That's the curse of the clock, yeah. Do, so it's, do, you know. Do, do we know who designed it or, or made it? Or? Ooh, boy, now that, that will get you into an argument with Czech historians almost quicker than anything else. Really? The answer is we know who built the tower and did the amazing Gothic hermetic symbols on the surrounding of the clock. And we know the person who built the first clock, but the person who turned the first clock into the clock the way it works at the moment is mythological, shall we say. In other words, there's all these weird myths that have developed around him. And nobody really knows who he was. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, nobody knows his name? Well, we have several names for who we think it was, but again, like I'm saying, you know, if you pick one of those, you'll start a, uh, an argument with a Czech historian in a flash. So all we know is the name of the guy who built the first clock, and then a few years after that it was fixed and turned into the form it is now. And, um, you know, we, we really don't know the guy's name. There's all sorts of legends about Faust and uh, the fact that he was blinded after he finished it so that he couldn't make another clock. and So he wanted to touch the clock gears one last time, and when he did, he made the clock stop. And, uh, you know, it, it, all of these are sort of true, but they're not really the real story, which is lost in the myths of time. But, but around here... connections again to the angels and that type of thing? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the big Prague stories is the golem, the artificial human. And actually, the, the Old Town Clock itself is a esoteric model of cosmic man, cosmic humanity. You have the five bodies or the five levels um, that interact, and the bottom is um, on the paving stones where you can stand in front of the clock. And the idea is that the clock is this overall summary of how the five elements, the five bodies, how the awareness of humanity reaches between the earth and the stars. You know, how you become a master of space-time. So it, it's one of these just really, um, truly bizarre little pieces of history and magic. It, it's pretty amazing. And that's, um, that's all through Prague, though, I mean... Oh, yeah, well, Prague is, is like that. I mean, it's um, – the you, you mentioned the books I wrote about Fulcanelli. Fulcanelli in Paris talks about these Gothic imageries on the front of a couple of churches and a couple of houses. Well, here it's like the church fronts exploded with this hermetic alchemical imagery, and they just flew all over town – and stuck themselves on house signs and in odd little corners and under balconies. and uh, it, It's truly amazing. So they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Um, I just finished an article uh, about one block of Naradova Street in which you can discover a basic alchemical primer that describes you know, some of the key components and gives a really incredible summary of the overview of the whole work. Mm -hmm. And that's in one block uh, of a street that's just up the hill from here. Now, to do that, you would have to be uh, symbol literate, and you'd to have be able to, to have, read it. Yeah. To be able to read it, you'd have to be symbol literate, and you'd have to have some basis in occult research. That's right, and you would have to have some knowledge of al of alchemical symbolism. Right, of course, and and you have that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty good at it. I'm not quite to Fulcanelli's level, but uh, after two books on Fulcanelli, I can do a good good version. So. That's right, you did write on Fulcanelli. Fulcanelli is a name, I've mentioned this in a previous show with uh, Michael Tessarian, that oh, yeah. uh, if you say the name Fulcanelli, people just, they don't really know who you're talking about. I mean, I've read Fulcanelli's book, um, or the book that was put out after his death, If you know. Uh huh. The symbol about all the uh, occult symbolism in, in yeah. architecture. Dwellings of the philosophers. Exactly. Yeah. Great book. Great book. Well, this is the city of the philosophers. It's not just a couple of dwellings. This is the city of the philosophers. And the city of the alchemists. 
Yeah. Well, particularly this little hill, um, this is sort of like the alchemical zone uh, at the moment. Uh, the serious modern uh, pagyrical alchemists, the alchemists who do the elixir of life stuff, have a store one block down the street on the corner. Okay. And they will sell you all sorts of very entertaining aqua vitae, which is, uh, you know, really strong alcohol with herbs and stuff in it. Amazing stuff. <laughs> wow. Definitely will cure what ails you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like moonshine with herbs. Yay. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and um, there's, some, there's some pretty interesting folks. They have their little alchemical guild meetings down there. They must so, invite yeah. you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking down there next month. So. <laughs> of course you are. Um, I actually have a question about uh, magic. Could you uh -huh. tell me the difference between a magician, a sorcerer, and an alchemist? Okay. A, a magician generally is pretty much the same thing that we say now in modern parlance when we mean a shaman. In other words, it's a person who, through his skills and his techniques, has interaction with the spirit world. Okay. And that interaction is not mediumistic, it's controlled. In other words, it's that ability to get the spirits to respond and give you information or do what you want them to do and so forth. So magician is pretty much like the broader New Agey term shaman. Okay. okay. Now sorcery is a subset of that. And a sorcerer is the person who creates illusions and gets people to do things against their will. And these days, the best sorcerers all are high-paid advertising execs. <laughs> because that's all advertising is, is putting out the glamour or the sorcery to get you to buy things that you really don't want or need. You know? Right, exactly. So, so that's one of these modern fields in which your magical experience uh, can be of use. Now, alchemy is an application of the magical shamanic practices in a physical or chemical way. In other words, you are actually doing things with metals and with herbs and with you know, chemical processes, distillation, etc. But you're doing it with a magical intent and you're using this shamanic communication with the spirits to supply the extra energy, the, the jump of awareness and energy necessary to make the transmutation happen. Okay. So they're, they're interrelated kind of ideas. Um, magician we usually use in the West with the sort of, you know, qualification of ceremonial magician. Right. And that's a technical term that refers to the people who do the golden dawn, who vibrate Hebrew badly and draw pentagrams in the air and, you know, generally have this attitude of being... You know, I am a magician. Mm. So it's a little pejorative. Um, I, I personally think that if anybody brags about being a great magician, they probably aren't. Right. right. But I have met a few people through the years who, who actually knew what they were doing and, um, you know, understood the basic principles. But they don't, they, gener they don't generally go around shouting from the rooftops, beating their chest. No, and they don't go, well, you know, I'm a blankety-blank degree, blankety-blank of the blankety-blank order of, you know, it's like, okay. Yeah. Uh, th those people, you know, they're nice, and, and I, I have a lot of friends uh, in the magical community. You, you couldn't help but run into those people, given the kind of research that I do. Right. But, um, you know, the, the real magicians are always the quiet people sitting in the back, because one thing I've learned is that the more you know how to do magic, the less magic you actually do. <laughs> now, why would, it's a why very would that dangerous be? dangerous thing. Okay. Well, it's a very dangerous thing to manipulate reality, particularly if you don't know exactly how your manipulation is going to turn out. Okay. And, uh, the, you know, the Sorcerer's Apprentice story from Fantasia is, is a good example of that. You know, right. you think it's easy. Okay, well, let's just get the brooms to carry water for us. Oop, well... How do I stop them now? You know? Right. So. 
Now, a little bit of magic goes a long way. How about today's? In today's work, we talk about today's world. We talk about uh, psychometry and and oh, yeah. ESP and oh, yeah. uh, remote influencing, and mm-hmm. we have all these new terms for the. How would that fit into the three areas you just described? All of those would fall under the larger umbrella of natural science or magic. Okay. Um, psychometry is just one of those natural skills. If you have a, a a magician who has those talents, then they would learn certain things and progress in certain ways. Uh, remote viewing is just astral traveling or the way Dee and Kelly did it, scrying in a crystal ball. Mm-hmm. So it's, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new, just new names. That's right. Just new, you know, new ways of looking at things. That's right. Now, what are some of the, I just keep wanting to drill down a little bit into the magical realm. Um, mm-hmm. You're saying the quiet ones are the powerful ones. What would you, what would you classify as an act of powerful magic? 